What's the difference or fundamental difference in a coach and a mentor? You think about your mentor and they were probably in the exact same role that you were in the exact same industry, maybe even in the exact same company. It's just hard to get that fresh perspective, right? You're basically looking at someone else's playbook where a coach is going to help you define your own playbook. How do I know I need a coach? When do I, like, are there signals? What you want to look for is fit. That's both from a personality standpoint. What is a performance breakthrough for you? Tell me in one sentence, five words or less. A lot of people couldn't do that. No, I think accountability is the glue, right? You can just announce to the world, here's what I want to achieve. If we, that voice inside of our head is the only person we're going to be accountable to, we're in trouble. What are three resources that you recommend to someone listening? Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Aaron. Aaron was a VP of retail merchandising at Cons Home. You were the head of demand strategy at Amazon Publishing. You were VP of strategic development at Headset. And most recently, you founded Performance Mindset Coaching, where you're the founder and a professional speaker at. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to a good discussion. One thing I always like to understand is, how do you decide to get into coaching? What is it that sparked that, hey, I'm going to go coach and help people? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a question I get asked quite a bit because it's, there's always a story behind it, right? No one comes out of college saying, I want to be a coach. For me, it was really spending about a decade being on the other side of the table, being the client of coaching. And, you know, I was put into a leadership role at an early age, you know, 23, 24 years old, put in charge of running a $100 million business. And while I scaled my career from that point to eventually becoming a senior executive of a billion dollar company by the age of 30, I tell people all the time, I'm confident I made every mistake there was to be made kind of on that journey. And it got to a point where I think the famous quote really started to apply to me when I look myself in the mirror. And that was what got me here is not going to get me there. So that's where I realized, okay, I'm a bit out over my skis. I'm going to have to develop at a faster, more accelerated rate. And it was the realization that doing that alone was just simply not going to get me to where I wanted to go fast enough. And that's when I brought on a coach. That was a, a pretty trajectory changing experience for me because it forced me to really go in to the development areas and the weaknesses that quite frankly, I was able to avoid for a long time prior to that. And one of the things that jumped out was I needed to, to become a more effective leader. Yeah. At 23, 24 years old, we don't know how to lead teams and people. And to make a long story short, that's what opened my eyes on the power of leadership and how, what an awesome responsibility that is by focusing on others, helping other people reach that next level. And that began to be the thread that started to dangle that I just kept pulling on over the next seven, eight, nine years that became a gravitational pull that eventually ended up me founding my own firm. I have a lot of tangents I want to go on based yeah. off of that. But <laughs> one thing that would uh, would be good to establish for anyone listening is what's the difference or fundamental difference in a coach and a mentor? Yeah, I, I think a mentor is just there very high level, right? To be there to, you know, maybe help bounce some things off of. I think mentors can come in many different shapes and sizes. Where I like to think of coaching, you know, one of the best descriptions I kind of help really explain when it comes to coaching is having that partnership where it is, it is an engaged partnership that can really help disrupt your thinking. If we're just left to our own devices and letting our mind run wild, you know, it's very difficult to be able to see around corners. It's very difficult to continue to broaden our perspectives, to see problems and solutions from in a completely different lens and where a mentor may be there for you to just bounce things off of very informal, very high level, you know, once a month, whatever, whatever it is a coach is going to be there for you to almost help you implement the systems, implement the structure. You almost feel like you've got a co-pilot riding along with you with the weekly ups and downs that come along with any type of up and to the right trajectory that professionals are going through. And yeah, I think it's going to be that accountability source. It's going to be that thought partnership. It's going to be that person who can help you see things that you may not be able to see. 
And one of the big common mistakes that I see with people finding mentors is there's a lot of confirmation bias, right? You think about your mentor and they were probably in the exact same role that you were in the exact same industry, maybe even in the exact same company. It's just hard to get that fresh perspective, right? You're, you're basically looking at uh, someone else's playbook where a coach is going to help you define your own playbook. What's going to be the thing that separates you, that elevates your uniqueness and gives that fresh perspective. So it's a much more engaged partnership than a mentor will ever be. How do you find a good coach? How do you utilize a coach effectively? Yeah, I like to think about it this way. It's like when you're finding a coach, I think the one thing that you want to look for is fit. That's both from a personality standpoint. I mean, you're going to be spending some time with this person. You're going to be getting deep with this person. They're going to be asking things of you that are going to force you to go places mentally that you're just not going to go on on your own. So when you're thinking about a coach, I think the first place you need to start is what am I getting coaching for? I think there's a coach for just about anything out there right now. And so if you're looking to improve your physical fitness, you're probably not going to go to a relationship coach, yeah. right? So I, I think it's kind of understanding what is it that you need coaching for? Who's going to be the best fit for you from a personality standpoint and where their background was? Because again, nobody starts as a coach, right? We all have a journey that's led us to coaching. And so is that a journey that can significantly add value to what you're looking to improve upon? And to get the most out of coaching, I think it really comes down to two things is really make sure you're, you're doing your homework, right? And so when you come into a coaching session, really no top of mind, if the coach were to ask you the question of what would make this hour or this hour and a half extremely valuable for you, I think the worst mistake you could make as a client and not get a higher return on your investment yeah. is just coming in saying, I, I don't know, you, you tell me. Yeah. But I think having that underlying awareness of you've identified what area you want to improve, you found the fit with the coach, make sure you're showing up every single week ready to drop something on the table that would add tremendous value and impact for what you're trying to do. And then with the end of every session, there's typically typically going to be some action steps, some takeaways, right? And so I think if you show up that way at the beginning and you're not afraid to take action at the end, it's kind of the barbell approach, right? If you always show up knowing how to get most out of the engagement and whatever you guys generate in terms of action plans and takeaways, you almost violently take action on, right? Don't hesitate, don't wait, take action on those, on those items I think those are the best possible ways for you to get an exponential return on your investment in a coach. When or how should someone building a company, a founder, how do they determine, how do you realize, when do you realize, oh, hey, maybe I should go to a coach? Because the reason I ask is, I know a lot of entrepreneurs in Austin. I don't feel like I've ever heard anyone say, hey, I think I should go get a coach for X. Mm -hmm. It's just not a thought that arises. Maybe it's monetary, maybe it's cost, yeah. but outside of that, it's just not a thought that occurs. Mm -hmm. So how should someone think about, do I need coaching? Could I use coaching? Could it help me? Because personally, sometimes I talk to folks and I'm like, I don't think you have the background or you haven't done the amount of work that I think would put you in a spot to like then coach me. Because mm -hmm. there's everyone is now a fractional CXO, is a coach, is, it's easy to put a title, right? That's but right. I fundamentally believe that if you've operated and you've done something and you have, you've put in the reps, yep. then I think, yes, you're better qualified to be someone to mm -hmm. guide people. I feel like there's, it's, you got to really weed out, right? Yep. So that's just a inherent bias that I have. Sure. But outside of that, how do I know I need a coach? When do I, like, w are there signals? Are there things I can look out for, and how do I know what the value of it is gonna be? Yeah, so I think a way to look at it is, is kind of think about, think about it in terms of what I refer to as the potential gap, okay. right? Anybody can sit back and say, what is the gap between the level at which I'm currently operating at, kind of where I'm at today, my current state, 
And what is the level at which I know deep down in my core that I'm fully capable of? Regardless of any type of coach's background or whatever it is, I'm just a firm believer that coaching can help everyone. There's gonna be degrees to it. I mean, there's a reason why there's a, you know, cars all do the same thing, but you can buy a Toyota Corolla for 30,000 or you could spend 350K on a Bentley, right? Yeah. They, they're gonna do the same thing, but they're, yeah. the, the, the quality is gonna be, is gonna be different. And so that gap between the level we're currently operating at and the level that you know there's potential there for, that gap represents our potential. And so back to the question of when do I know I'm ready for a coach? When is the right time to bring in coaching? I think it really comes down to your commitment on how much are you committed, willing, and have the desire to close that gap. And so it really all comes down to if you put the time in as a client, I think even the worst coaches can help you to some degree, right? It may be the Toyota Corolla. It's still going to drive. It's still going to drive on the street. It's still going to get you from point A to point B. But when you're looking to get there faster, when you're looking to get there in a bit more of a smoother way, when you're looking to reduce the number of unforced errors and can leverage kind of a thought partnership or coaching system or structure that allows you to remain have high levels of awareness, have high levels of clarity, be accountable for someone. And strangely enough, some of the most successful people on the planet say they all need help staying accountable, right? Yeah, I think it comes down to your internal desire when you're ready to kind of make that next step. And if you're looking for a way to do it in an accelerated way. And so if you're maybe feeling blocked, you maybe feel like you're not making the progress that you know you should be. You're not moving as fast as you as you should be, and you're, you're just ready to make more progress, I think coaching can be a value and benefit for any professional that's kind of feeling those things. So you said gap. Mm. I feel like unless you really know what you want, where you're at in life, a lot of people will not really look at the gap as, hey, there's so much to do because you always assume that, you know, I'm doing the best that I can. Mm -hmm. How much more can it do? I don't think a lot, I could be wrong about this. I don't think a lot of people are actually like, oh no, I have like 10x potential of where I'm at mm -hmm. and I need to bridge that gap. Yeah. But how does someone know how big the potential gap is? Yeah, that's where I'll take the other side of that, right? So I think someone who's thinking that way, this is just the best that I've got. This is the best that I can do. I would put them as, yeah, they're probably uncoachable, right? If that's gonna be the mindset that they're operating with, I mean, I operate off the Henry Ford quote, right? Whether you think you can or think you can't, you'll always be right. And so if that is the thought process, if that is the mindset, yeah, they're probably not coachable. They are probably not going to be a great candidate for a coach because they're not going to show up willing to grow and they're not going to give the coach a whole lot to work with. Yeah. But I think we all know deep down, sure, that may be what the voice is telling us, but we all know to at least some degree inside whether we are absolutely performing as our best version. Back to the statement you made, yeah, we may be doing the best we can right now, but that could be a result to a lot of bad habits. That could be a result of lack of effort. It could be a result of us not taking advantage of opportunities. So there could be some inputs that generate the outputs that, yeah, this is the Make best the we can, better. That, yeah, that we can do right now but you still got to play the what if game. Well, what if I was better prepared? What if my priorities were clear? What, I, what if I put more focus in these key areas? And what if I stayed accountable here and I had a coaching system and partnership around me to help me do that? I think the people that thought, well, this is the best that I can do right now. I think if they shifted that mindset of saying, what could I do? What would need to be true for me to go to a different level? Because that voice inside of our head can can trick us into a lot of things, but at our core, we know when we're not operating at the absolute best version that, because then you would be happy as hell, right? If you felt that you were waking up every single day and going to sleep every single night, performing at your absolute peak performance that you could do, I mean, that's a high purpose, high fulfillment life, right? But the people saying the things that you just mentioned are miserable, right? Because this is the best that I can do right now, but I'm surrounded with shitty routines, yeah. bad habits, lack of accountability, weak preparation, and this is just the result of the best that I can do because of all of these headwinds that I've created for myself. So I would just challenge that with what if 
you built a system around you that then promoted next level performance and achievement. And I think everybody with at least an ounce of honesty in their body would say, yeah, there's absolutely better, better performance. There's absolutely more achievement. There's absolutely more potential than what I'm giving today. 100%. Going back a little bit, has there been a coach you've worked with that's changed your perspective on things that where the before and after was so drastic where you were like, oh, like I didn't know I was falling behind on so much, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a moment or time or like a, uh, a story you can give about a pivotal coach and a pivotal like thing that helped you with? Yeah, yeah, I've actually had the privilege of doing some work with Robin Sharma. For those that don't know him, he's kind of the author behind books like The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, The 5 A.M. Club, The Leader Who Had No Title. I've heard these books, never read them. Yeah, and so he, for me, was such a impactful force on the personal development journey because he introduced to me this, this concept of personal mastery, right? And so what does it actually look like to be so committed to finding your own unique version of personal mastery? And what are the things that get in the way? Ego, the, the fear of looking foolish. We, we, we don't want to look stupid. We are, we're so worried about what other people think that we're not even being authentic. We're not even doing the things that require continuous improvement. And I was there. I mean, when I had a lot of corporate success early on in my career, where I was a 30 year old senior executive title running or helping run a billion dollar publicly traded company, a lot of things can happen in that scenario. And one of those things is, is that success can breed complacency. It always does, right? You can't think that you're going to be an exception. If you've had a lot of success, complacency will be there ready to knock on your door. You've heard championship teams talk all the time, far more difficult to repeat the second time than it was to win the first time. Tons I would also call it a level of comfort. Of Outside of complacency, bingo. it's it's more, there's no catalyst, there's no reason to change, there's no reason to put in the half extra step, the extra step. Yeah, because look at what I've done. Look at yeah. what I've achieved. Yeah. Look how great I am. I've got this thing all figured out, right? And that's the one-two punch. You get comfortable to where you're at, and before you even know it, like a thief in the night, complacency sneaks its way in. And for me, that was an eye-opening experience and understanding what the best of the best do to find their level of personal mastery and then looking at myself where I kind of let some of this success go to my head, inflate my ego. I was in cruise control. I wasn't, it was that feeling eating away at me. I knew I wasn't operating at the best version of myself. I mean, Michael Jordan had a coach, Steve Jobs had a coach, Tiger Woods has a coach. I mean, it's like, if the best of the best have this support system around them, I had a little bit of success in my 20s and just thought that I could go in cruise control. His concept of personal mastery was that I almost kind of consider it the electric shock paddles to the system that woke me up and made me realize that I'm operating with basically about a 30% of what I know my full potential to be and really got me back into a growth mode of saying, instead of me resting on what I've already achieved, get committed and install the discipline to find out what more I'm mm -hmm. capable of, what more greater impact I can make. And that, that changed my life. It changed my whole trajectory. It changed everything that I started doing from that point on. And had I not discovered those concepts and have that engagement, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. That's, that's for sure. Helping other people, you know, find and tap into those same higher levels of performance. One counter to that that I would make is, how do you know what you're capable of? Because again, to my earlier question, I was listening to another podcast mm -hmm. where they were like, oh, I was making 100K salary and making 500K a year was just unimaginable. It was just not even in the question because mm -hmm. you're making 100, 200K in tech. Maybe you'll go up 5, 10%, 20%. But the thought never occurred that, oh, I could make a million a year. Mm -hmm. It's just, but once you start the, okay, like instead of going 2X, let me, how do I make a million? How do I make 2 million, 3 million? Yep. Once you start thinking on those lines, you may not have the answer, but now you start questioning everything of like, hey, why am I stuck in this 100, 200 range? That's right. 
But I feel like it takes a lot of maturity to break out of what you don't know, mm -hmm. right? So how do you figure out what are you capable of? How do you even know like where that goes? Okay, I know I'm not doing something right now. Yep. I know I can do better. Right. But is better 1.2x? Is better 10% more? 20% more? Mm -hmm. Is better like a 10x increase? How, how do you judge what that yeah. capability level is? You know what? That question speaks to what holds so many people back. And what sits underneath that, kind of the underlying psychology is a focus on the outcome, right? From, well, what if I wanted to make a million? What if I wanted to get to this level? What if I wanted to get to that level? You're, the priority and the focus is, all, is, is put on this shiny object that's blinking at you from on top of the mountain, right? The perspective shift that I would take is focus on the journey, focus on that very next step. And you, sometimes, look, for you to keep making progress, you don't have to know what the ceiling is. Makes sense. What instead, if you started to commit to just getting 1% better every day, 1% better every week, and watch that compound, because everybody that has reached the top, everybody that is considered the best of the best, are all surprised by their success, right? They didn't, you know, this is not what Elon Musk was dreaming up when he was a, a, a kid. And yeah. I mean, there's example after example after example that if you stay true to the process, you keep grinding away, not focused on what the potential outcome could be or the potential ceiling, but it's you're leveraging the most magical creation known to man, which is you're generating compound interest for yourself. So who knows is the real question. No one's going to know what you're fully, what you're fully capable of, what your full potential is, but there is one way to find out and that's continuing to show up to get better and better and better each and every day. Keep fighting complacency, staying away from the comfort zone. And you just never know through that process and not the focus on the outcome, but the focus on the process, what new doors are going to open that are going to have a hundred more behind them. The one thing that I can guarantee you is that you'll never be able to open that door if you get stuck in status quo. If you let the complacency bug bite and you stop getting better, that is a surefire way for that ceiling of whatever max potential is to keep lowering and lowering and lowering. But I think it's never meant to be, um, this is not a finite game we're talking about here. I think this is more of the, the infinite game that the way that I would recommend looking at this is this year's ceiling can be next year's floor, right? And so if you continue- Go up from there. Right, and who knows where the max ceiling is, but with more experience, with more reps, with more focus, with more commitment, you should be able to continue getting better and better and better and better until who knows when. And so, yeah, I think that's kind of the, the message is, and it's not always about the outcome. And as a matter of fact, you gotta be able to do this work blindly of not knowing what the outcome is gonna be. Trusting in the process that if you focus on continued improvement, keep generating progress on your own path towards per personal mastery, the opportunities for massively impactful outcomes will show up. Can you give an example of someone you're working with, and we don't have to talk names, but more just, hey, they were an expat, walk them through a program and then as whatever system you have mm -hmm. and then they were able to do x do you have an example that yeah yeah i've got one of my one of my long-term clients right now has been making the observation recently and we've been working together for almost two years now so it's been, it's been a pretty intense run we meet every single week have for almost two years and one of the things that he continues to surprise himself on is actually the same thing that we just talked about Two years ago, he had some of those art artificial ceilings in place, and he was letting his own expectations of what he thought his potential to be. When you think about that from a working backwards standpoint, he was, wasn't was pushing near hard enough, we knew that there was more potential that was there, but just didn't think that, that he could achieve it. And through our work, when we put in, put in these systems in place, we are forcing the hard questions around what can we do to keep making progress? There's the accountability of saying, all right, if you said this is over the next 30 days, if you did this, it would be a massive leap in your performance and impact. And then having to stay accountable to making A, taking those actions, and then B, 
measuring the results, within a few short months, he's doing things and in, in taking on risk and challenges and signing up for all kinds of different opportunities to lead different projects that he never would have before. So I, I think the moral of that story is there's never going to be a substitute for taking action. When you can narrow your focus to be able to understand what needs to be true to get me from point A to point B. Based on that truth, what do I need to start doing right now? And so for me to be where I'm, I want to be in six months from now, what do I need to achieve this week? To, based on what do I need to achieve in the first month, you just work backwards from where you want to be. And I think when you have somebody that can help push you, that can help you stay accountable to doing the after action review, this is what we committed to, what worked, what didn't work, what should we recalibrate on? It's almost kind of having that strategic resource that's purely dedicated to you, that's just that helpful voice, that helpful presence to calibrate your approach to getting better. And his comment was, I am just now realizing that for basically my entire life, I've been setting the ceiling way too low. I now know that with the right plan, the right system, the right, the right ability to track and measure, these are just milestones. I can keep bursting through glass ceiling after glass ceiling. And so I know high level, but that's kind of the gist of yeah. what one of my relationships with a client looks like right now. Of just we're kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. We don't know where the, where the, ceiling, where the yeah. ceiling is, where the top of the mountain is. But what we do know is we keep bursting through the expectations that we've set for ourselves in these three, six, nine, and 12 month time periods. Um, and that's been, that's been very powerful to watch. When someone's working with a coach, how much of it is, okay, I'm just going to do everything you tell me to. And how much of it should be, are you sure this is the right thing for me to do? Maybe I should like, how much should I question the guidance versus how much should I just be like, okay, you know, you tell me to do, I'll do, I'll just blindly follow X. Yeah, I, I think it should be the opposite of that, right? You, that's where you start getting more into like maybe the mentor or consultant or advisor stage. A coach's job is not to tell you what to do. It's really to help you understand, help you see where is it that you want to go. And so kind of back to that potential gap, right? If we're operating at the level that we're currently operating at, well, what does that potential look like? What do you know you're capable of doing what does a performance breakthrough look like for you in the next 12 months? Really helping them crystallize that because that's part of the problem, right? Is we don't know what we're capable of. I think we all, everybody listening to this, we all want growth. We all want better results. We all want to generate greater performance. But if we had to define that, if I had to, if I asked you that, that question is like, what is a performance breakthrough for you? Tell me in one sentence, five words or less. A lot of people couldn't do that. Five a lot of words. A lot of people don't have that type of crisp clarity around what exactly a performance breakthrough or next level performance looks like for them. Do you have an example of performance breakthrough? Yeah. So, you know, one, one example, I'm working with a client and they're in the insurance space and they're doing well, but their next level is to break in. They want to be a top 2% national agency. Top two. Okay. Top two. That's right. Okay. And so, we're having to then work backwards from that of saying, all right, if that's the goal, buy when? And we set that date. And so if we're trying to become and get them at a performance level of breaking, and, and right now if they're sitting around that six to 7% and they wanna get into the top 2%, what needs to be true? And it can't be 20, three, tw uh, 20 different things. We're gonna narrow the focus in on the- Three things, top. The three to five things that we're going, that, that are the absolute dependencies for that to happen. That if these three things don't happen, that's just a wish and a hope, right? But what are those three things that if we executed at a world-class level would be absolute dependencies to get you there? And then from there, and that's, that's when the work really starts. And so I'm not advising anything per se as much as helping them clarify what is it that they really want? Why is it that they want that. It's one thing to know what you're pursuing. It's something totally different to know why you're pursuing it and then what must be true. Once we have those guardrails in place, that then allows us to really get into the work and say, okay, if this is one of the things that must be true in the next 90 days, 
what are going to be the top priorities to kind of make that happen? What are the underlying priorities that above anything else, this is where you're going to try to 10x your focus on these three things that makes this big initiative come true within this period. And so it's me helping them determine and get clarity on what these things are because you're not determining how to do it. That's not my job is to tell them what they need to, what they need to be striving for, what they need to be doing. It's my job to really help sure that they can generate the right awareness where they can then find the right clarity for us to be able to build a plan around that the system now becomes, are you going to execute this or not? And so when we can break it down to its simplest form, where they now have a prescriptive blueprint on what to follow based on what they want, why they want it, when they want to achieve it, that's where, that's where the work becomes very powerful. And because this wasn't my idea, I'm not telling them they should be in the top 2%. They have a, an emotional connection with this. This is where they want to be. This is why they want to be there. This is what they want to achieve. I'm just helping provide the, the landscape and the system that makes that journey as seamless as possible and ideally as efficient as possible. I kind of like to use it in terms of uh, you pull out your phone and look at Google Maps, right? We must have two critical data points for that tool to work. We've got to have our current location. We've got to have our destination. If those two things are abstract or vague, we're not going to get an optimized route. So what I'm essentially helping leaders do is get extraordinarily next level clear on what those two data points are, why the destination is the destination, and then we build that route together. And then when you've got to answer to a system that is essentially the forcing mechanism to continue the progress, that makes all the difference in the world. How many, how many New Year's resolutions fail? There's a 96% failure rate in the United States with New Year's resolutions. Why? Because it's just a wish and a hope and there's no system around it. You're not accountable to anybody. You don't, there's no system in place. You may want to get here, you know, by the end of the year, but you don't even know what, what's the most important thing in week one, right? And so, and if there's not a strong enough why, you'll never figure out how. Random fact on the New Year's thing. <laughs> someone had an app idea. He's like, maybe some, someone should make like an escrow account of like, hey, I'm going to lose 10 pounds this year. Mm -hmm. You put 500 bucks in the account. If you, um, if you don't do it, you lose the 500. Mm -hmm. But if you finish it before the year, you get it back. Yeah. Maybe more with interest or whatever, right? Um, yeah. Really random idea, but it's like one of those like, hey, are you going to stick to this like, mm -hmm. accountability, right? No, I, and I think accountability is the glue, right? And, and it could be as simple, it doesn't even have to be that advanced. You can just announce to the world, here's what I want to achieve. It's, if it's losing that, those 10 pounds, I'm going to lose one pound a month, and I'm going to come right back here in this space, whether it's LinkedIn or wherever else, to, to commit to my progress. Just simply doing that in public yeah. rewires the psychology around well, shit, people are, like, people are expecting this now. You've heard I, about the whole build in public. That's right. That's so like every tech startup, they're like, hey, if you want to like, you know, build a brand, build value, you start building in public. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I like your journey. I like the progress you've made. Maybe now I want to come use what you're doing. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and then give yourself proof that you're executing the plan, right? And if you slip up and don't execute, have that support system around you, whether through a coach, whether through your tribe, whatever it is, saying, hey, you, you, promised, you promised by the end of January you were going to be a down a pound. Where are you? Where is that? We don't have that in the vast majority of our goals, our, our initiatives, our milestones. And so if we, that voice inside of our head, is the only, only person we're going to be accountable to, we're in trouble. Is it ever too early for someone to reach out to a coach or performance coach? No, I, I don't think there's, I mean, one of, one of my biggest mistakes and something that I hear with just the two clients that, I, that I've brought up in this conversation, we've all said the same thing. I wish I would have done this earlier, right? And Cause you never, you don't know what you don't know. Right? You don't know what you don't know, but this is one hell of a way to find out, right? Like blind spots will always stay blind if you don't shine light on them. 
And it's extraordinarily difficult for us to always being able to shine our own light on our own blind spots. And blind spots to a leader or a professional is like cigarettes to the body. They will slowly kill you, I promise you. And yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's ever too early. You know, one of the big myths that I they exist on both ends of the spectrum. I think coaching still going through this breaking out of a negative stigma, yeah. right? Where when I first started coaching, I heard the same two things over and over. On one end of the, of the spectrum, people said, oh, I, I, I thought this, I thought coaching and performance coaching was kind of reserved as a perk for like Fortune 500 executives. Like CEOs, executives. Yeah, it's like, well, if you thought that, why do you think the best of the best are universally leveraging coaching, but you're not? So. If they're going to be getting better faster than you, how in the hell are you ever going to catch up to get on that on that type of level, right? So flawed logic. But the more pervasive one was, oh, I thought coaching was something you got when you just when you like were on a performance plan or like you were underperforming or your company brought this in when you needed help. And so it's I think it's that one on that end of the yeah. spectrum. Our pride, our ego gets in the way of saying. I need help. I want to get better. I know I've got more potential and getting this type of help should not be thought of as, as a negative. Yeah. Right. 100%. I mean, part of the same with, with me as well. Right. Like I think people or like, at least personally, I'm like, I, th I feel like I can do this. Like, I know I can do this. Mm -hmm. I know if I find the right mission, the right idea, right product, whatever, I'm confident that I can get it to a certain level. Sure. But, I also understand that maybe there's, you know, I, I don't want to call it a cheat code, but like there's probably a shortcut. There's yeah. probably like, do you have to learn and make every mistake? Maybe not. Do I think it's a better outcome if you go the long way? Maybe like you probably learn a lot more along, along the way, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily the right path all the time. And I think that's what a lot of people face, right? Is like, can I do this on my own? Yeah, probably. But then it comes down to how committed to getting better are you and how are you valuing your time? Yeah. 100%. And if you put big priorities on both of those, coaching becomes the obvious answer because if you're going to go on your own, it's going to take you a hell of a lot longer. You're going to have a lot more bruises, scratches and scars along the way. And you still may not get to where you where you want to be. You may get 70% there. And and so I think we all, and, and, and I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and one of the things that holds true is every organization, especially in the, in the early stage mode, but the same can be held for executive leaders too. Everyone, especially in this business environment, is looking for ways to generate better results faster with fewer resources. And when you can find systems that give you leverage, Alex Harmozy says this, and I think it's brilliant. It's like, look, man, the game is rigged, right? This whole thing that we call business, this game we call business is rigged, but in a good way. It's rigged by those who find the most leverage the fastest are the ones who usually win. We all, regardless of background, regardless of wealth, regardless of anything else, we all only have 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 12 months in a year. So when you're able to make better, greater progress within those time increments than everybody else, you're going to get ahead, right? But too many people are too proud. They don't want to ask for help. They think they can do it on their own. And they end up doing something at a lower quality that took them, them 10 times longer versus someone else who found leverage and won the game. And I think that's so important for especially a lot of early stage entrepreneurs. It's like, yeah, it's going to be a grind, but I come back to tennis and tennis is one of those sports that has this statistic that I think more business professionals need to think about. And that's unforced errors. So when you look at a top rated tennis player, number one in the world gets upset at Wimbledon by this, you know, young kid, like what the hell happened? Always go to the unforced errors column they will kill you, right? And so if you're looking for ways to get better results faster with fewer resources, gain the leverage to win the game, you have to pay attention to unforced errors. Don't think it's a rite of passage where you have to make all the mistakes. That's bullshit. 
find solutions to where you're making high quality mistakes because you're stretching so hard, so high and making progress, you fail well, but also do the due diligence to not make the mistakes that you shouldn't be making too, right? And I think just by not making stupid mistakes can get you ahead so much further faster. And that's what I don't see enough people kind of realizing right now. You made the statement about doing more in the same amount of time. Mm. I don't know what I was listening to the other day. Some guy on a podcast was like, you protect your money, keep it in a bank, you keep it in a safe, you're protecting your cash and monetary mm. value, but people don't protect their time. They'll randomly throw their time out to anyone and everyone and whatever. That's right. And I think people don't realize that you can always make more money, um, but you're never going to get back your time. So are you working on the right? Like I've been thinking about this for the past couple of months of how do I be more intentional? Mm. How do I spend time on the things that I think matter? Right. Whether that means building a business, being more productive or just spending time with family or, right. you know, taking a step back and like I do leather working, but I haven't made a wallet in like three, four months. <laughs> I enjoy doing it, but I just haven't made the time sure. to like go to the, do those things. Maybe I should. Maybe doing that unlock something that I would have never realized. But for whatever reason, I haven't been able to make that time. Why do you think that is? Why haven't I made the time? Or why, what, what do you think is causing you to not be able to, to have the time? Doing too many things and being stuck with business outcomes. I need to, I want to build this podcast. I'm spending time doing this. Mm -hmm. And my agency, my nine to five. And then we're moving. And there's always something that is, seems more important, right? Yep. But I think it comes down to priorities of, I know that if I want to make time for it, I can make time for it, yep. but I feel like something else will suffer. That's right. And then that thought is what I'm like, okay, I can't let my agency suffer. I need to get more clients. I can't let the podcast suffer. Cause then if I get bored or of doing the podcast, mm -hmm. then the notion I started out with, I don't want that to happen. Right. And so it's, something's always going to suffer. And for the last probably eight, nine years, it's been my health. Mm -hmm. I lose weight, I gain weight. And every time I'm like focused on something else, this will get this. Will, and I think it's just the notion of, I know I probably have time for it. I can mm. probably make, I can probably be super efficient and you know, I can still get stuff done. I was asking Justin the other day, Hey, I'll make your wallet. I'm like, Hey, tell me what you like. Mm -hmm. I'll start designing it. But I just feel like something will give. That's right. And so, Either I have to be okay with that, but then I have to understand, okay, does making a wallet make me happy enough that whatever gets pushed off the list, I'm okay with pushing off the yeah. list. I don't know, but I mean, it's when I hear that, well, I just don't, I don't have enough time or, you know, just, just don't have the bandwidth. My immediate response is then let's just, let's just say what it is. It's not a priority, right? Because a lot of the distractions, a lot of the lack of bandwidth it will always come back down to priority mismanagement. 100%. And I could go on and on about this, but I'll just use the, have you heard the Warren Buffett story that with this pilot? No. Who knows if this is true or not, but it, it sounds like Buffett and the, the moral of the story so spot on. He asked his pilot that was working with him for a long time to, you know, what's your bucket list? What, what are the top 25 things that you would like to achieve before you die? Spend a week on that, bring it back next week and let's, let's take a look at it. So pilot got excited, right? He made, made this big list, brought it back to, to Warren. Warren looked at it for a minute and said, shave it down to three things. It's like, Oh, okay. Spent the next week, took the list of 25 down to three, brought it back. And he says, okay, do you still have the other 22 items? says, yep, they're right here. Buffett says, that becomes your no list. Because here's what happens with human psychology. If you don't say no to those other 22 things, these three things will never happen. Yeah. They're too interesting. They have some level of interest. You want to do them, but you have determined they're just not at the priority of these things. And if I could just take the focus of what would normally go across 25 I different think. things, kind of spreading your focus all over the roulette table to get chips on every every number, right? I'm going all in on these three things. The other list becomes a no or not yet until these get done. And I think that's just a powerful story of just 
so many people, myself included, I'm not, I'm not immune to this because it happens the more successful you become, right? You think about someone who's at the top of their field, the top of their game, they're going to have way more opportunities thrown at them than, than someone who is just starting out, right? So it's actually more difficult to prioritize higher up the success ladder you go simply because there's going to be more things thrown at you, more tugs on your time. So prioritization becomes even more critical. Yeah, I, I, distractions are just another way of saying I mismanage my priorities, right? It's like as if the priorities were truly there, set in stone, locked in, and everything became less of a priority than these, I think people would get, it's kind of, it's counterintuitive, right? You're focusing on fewer things, expecting more to get done, but that's exactly what happens. Instead of you making 10 to 20% progress in 20 different areas, feeling like you haven't done anything, you're actually driving the ball down the field and putting it in, in the end zone on these two or three items. You're driving it to completion. And that's just a very, very different feeling. 100%. I feel like priorities, it's hard to pick one or two things or three things. It right? is. Especially where I'm currently in this like in between where I'm like, maybe I know what I want to do. Maybe I don't know what I want to do. There's so many like variables. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can stick to is, okay, I have the podcast, focus on my weight this year and grow the agency out where mm -hmm. it's just making 20, 30%. Right? right. Outside of that, I feel like I want to do everything but these three things though. Sometimes right. I'm just like, everything's shiny object syndrome for right? sure so there's always but it's also hard to say no because i'm like this seems like something i should you know spend a couple hours on but that's a couple hours i'm not spending doing anything related to these things and that's so. in back to buffett again back to steve jobs the, the best of the best always say the same thing when you ask about what's led to their success they all say in some type of derivative roundabout way is they had to get very good at saying no Right. And so a good, a good stress test on your ability to prioritize comes down to how frequently you're saying no, because if you're saying no a lot to protect these golden eggs that, that are the two or three things that you've determined as your priorities, that's always going to be a way of knowing that I've got, I'm executing strong prioritization. The more yes things you say that are outside of making direct impact and progress on those three things. There should almost be a, a, a warning siren kind of going off in your mind of saying, Ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing some, some bandwidth checks that I may not be able to cash. Right. And if I say yes to this, look at back at the golden eggs. And all of a sudden the progress that I felt so strongly about before saying yes to this is now at risk. And I think just developing those mental models for you to kind of have and for all of us quite frankly is to have those warning sirens go off when we say yes to something that's outside of our prioritization scope and this isn't to be sugar-coated there is nobody going to say this is easy work but it's the hard work it's the discipline it's the focus that separates the good from the great and it's hard it's hard as hell do you have recommendations on prioritization techniques or I mean, I feel like there's a lot of frameworks. Like I do a bunch mm -hmm. of product management and every time I read a book and someone talks about, oh, how I use XYZ framework mm -hmm. to decide this and prioritize and roadmap. My take on that is I feel like a lot of product management is intuition. It's a lot of like gut feeling mm -hmm. plus some quantitative data of like, okay, this is the right thing for us to work on. Yep. Yes, there are hundreds of frameworks. You can use every framework in the book. And Netflix, I, I heard the Netflix guy do a whole talk on how they prioritize what to do on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I feel like frameworks only work after a certain level. Up until then, it's like, hey, what's the most important thing mm -hmm. for me to do right now? I could get, because I feel like it's one of those like over optimizations, right? Like analysis. Yeah, I could run all these frameworks and still not like the output of what I should do. Yeah. Because my mind is like subconsciously like, hey, these, this is what you should be working on. Yep. But I don't know if you have recommendations yeah, for anyone no, listening it, that. It's. It's the backbone of what I do. I kind of like to think, yeah, frameworks are easy, right? I kind of think of frameworks are the ideas, right? But what's the operating system that you wrap around the framework to make it real, to really have it show up in your operations? And, and for me, I kind of, I, I apply even on one-on-one -on -one coaching, a derivative to the OKR system. I kind of brand it as my own as objectives and key priorities, right? And 
the first month of any engagement is doing some of that hard work that you just mentioned. We, we may spend a month of just going through back and forth, making sure we're properly scoring what are the top priorities? Because I think that's where so many people get tripped up is they pick the wrong priorities. After a month later, they switch the priority and, and, and it becomes almost like a priority whack-a-mole thing, right? So we do spend a lot of upfront time and understanding what are gonna be the top, in this case, objectives. What are gonna be the two or three things that we focus on this quarter? What will be the supporting key priorities that sit underneath it that are gonna be highly quantifiable, easily tracked. We're gonna know every single Monday, whether you were red, yellow, or green on this priority that supports this objective. There's no hiding from it. It's so black and white that if it's almost kind of like creating the plays to kind of score, score the touchdown, right? If the objective is the touchdown, what are the plays that are gonna get us down the field and get us to where we wanna be? And so without that operating system and I've seen a lot of companies try to do this and you're, you know, with you know, product management, I'm, I'm sure you've seen something resembling an OKR system not work way more than it's actually worked. It's because a framework without it, without an operating system around it does nothing for you. Right. And so I apply the coaching that fuels the framework that wraps the operating system around it to make sure that if we, if we commit to these things, we track and measure progress on these things, we do an after action review every single week of saying what went well and why, what didn't go as well as you thought, and how will we improve it the following week, and what did we learn? Do we need to calibrate anything? And so these are forcing mechanisms that it's hard to have with that voice inside of our head, but it's undefeated. If you execute this framework plus operating system, I've never not seen it work. And I see it work every single day with every single one of my clients. And so, yeah, I, I think you're right in the sense that a framework by itself is not gonna come in and fix all your problems. If it's not fully adopted and, and implemented through an operating system type of format within an organization or within a one-on-one -on -one engagement, the framework's just a framework. It's not gonna, it's just, it's, it's like an idea. We can come up with new ideas all, all the time, right? Yeah. But it's making it real. It's taking, it's taking the abstract and converting it into concrete results that drive continuous progress. And when you build that type of momentum, that's where the very next quarter, so the next three months, we get even better. We kind of back to how do you know what the potential is? Back to that one client, we start developing this operating momentum where the very next quarter, we raise the bar even more. We're, we're now setting targets and priorities that he thought a year or two years ago, it was like, that's, that's, not that's crazy talk. That's, uh, we're, we're not doing that. Now we show up every single day or every single week and we track the hell out of it. And any slight tweak of underperformance or a headwind, we dig in deep and, and address, well, why, why did we not hit the mark this week? What, what do you, is there something you can do differently? What do we learn from that? What can, what can we implement the very following week that won't allow that to happen again? And so when you commit to a system like that, it's hard to not make progress, but it does require next level discipline and also investment because that's, that, that's an exercise that's extraordinarily difficult to do on our own. And that's why I think you see OKRs or anything resembling it and so many organizations fail um, because they don't have the right supporting system to make the framework real. Makes sense. I like to ask a couple questions towards the end. So I'll just throw them at you. Fire away. What are three resources that you recommend to someone listening? Three resources. Books, podcasts, blogs, articles, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, um, the one podcast that I feel like I listen to every single outside week. Outside of this one. but Outside of yeah, this yeah. one. Um, that 100% of the time I feel like makes me smarter is the Knowledge Project by Shane Parrish. Okay. I think it's a deep dive on some of the, the greatest thinkers, greatest minds. And yeah, I think when you can sit there, listen to that and take notes, it's impossible to not get smarter. If I was president of the United States, one of the executive orders I would have is to make every 20 year old read the book Atomic Habits. I think that that's just, I've read it. My my only takeaway is 
you have to be ready to start trying to build those habits. Hundred percent. I mean, I read. I I only read like personal dev business like mm-hmm. kind of like nonfiction books and they're always so dense yep. there's so much like hey go do this 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 i'm like all of this is great but i actually need to figure out where to use what learning mm-hmm. and see if it helps me that's but right again i uh, yeah great it, book yeah yeah for me I, it, it's an annual reread i start every single year by rereading atomic habits just to kind of get my mind back in there because our our habits are everything Right. It's these use the same copy or are you an Kindle? E-book? Okay. You're yep. an ebook first. Yeah. Uh, just cause I read so much. It's, um, yeah. And it's easy to just export the PDF notes and, and email them to yourself. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think, you know, you, you show me someone who's wildly intelligent, super talented and has shitty habits. They will always get beat by someone less smart, less talented, but has incredibly strong habits. It's kind of like, as he says in the book, I mean, it's our habits that determine the trajectory of our life, right? You, yeah. you show me your habits. I'll show you your, your priorities, results. Man, yeah. Um, so I think that's an important one. And you know, the, the other thing, and this is probably my Robin Sharma training coming out, but I think from a resource standpoint is really looking at your mornings and making sure that the first hour that you can do something to set up the first hour of your day and you can pick and choose what it is for me it's a combination of cardio reading meditation but when you can make your first hour of every single day powerful i have just continued to be amazed year after year after year how it sets up your day so find a resource that gives you a rock solid morning routine and I call it the oxygen mass theory, right? It's like, how do you expect to be an effective leader for others when you're not an effective leader for yourself, yeah. right? So use that first hour to put on your oxygen mask and it just makes you that much more effective for the rest of the day. Alex Hermosi has this bit where he's like, I was talking to this guy and he's like, I woke up, I did my cardio, I did my meditation, I did this routine, I wrote my journal. And he's like, four hour, like, I mean, it takes three, four hours to get through like, you know, mm-hmm. a, a superficial morning routine. And he's like, just work. That's right. And instead of doing all yeah, of that not, shit. He's not a, yeah, Harmozi's not a big fan yeah. of morning routine. He's just like, just get the work done and you'll be surprised how much growth you have. Because the complaint this guy had was, I do everything you're supposed to do, mm-hmm. but I'm not making any progress. Because you're spending all your time doing those things and not doing the actual like thing. So there's always a trade-off. I yeah. 100% agree. Here's but- my... Here's my because I, I, I'm a big Harmozy fan. That just happens to be one of the few things that I disagree with because it's easy to make those blanket statements, but I personally don't think that they're attached, yeah. right? And so I think it's, he's a machine, so it's easy for him to just roll out of bed and just mm-hmm. start start crushing it. For me, I've experimented a lot of different ways. And tank top. I am so much more effective, efficient. I'm I'm mentally yeah. operating yeah. on a completely different level when I get it doesn't need to be three or four hours. I think it's an hour at the most yeah. because yeah, you don't want to burn, you know, half your day. But I think longevity is a thing, right? And so the longer you can stay in the game, the more successful you're yeah. going to yeah. you're going to be, right? And so if your morning routines are shitty and you're just rolling out of bed and starting to work by two or 3 PM that afternoon, I'm more likely than not able to run circles around that person because my morning routine has fortified me. I'm, I'm going to have more energy. I'm much more mentally balanced. And so I've, I've seen that prove out for me way more than not. And I've tried the no morning routine and just get up and, and get after it. I, I, you know, most people feel like they're kind of in a fog or I, at least I feel like I'm, it takes me a couple hours to just kind of like really get going where yes, I moved my wake up time earlier. So I get up at four 30 AM. And by the time I finish my routine around five 45, 6 AM, I'm clicking on all, all cylinders. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready to go. And it's usually before a lot of people even wake up, but my days are effing jam packed and it just couldn't be that way if I didn't have that oxygen mass part of the day. Makes sense. What's your tech stack? Um, how do you run your company? What's your recommendation? How do you work with clients? And so like Google notion, well, like what's your, so yeah, I mean, I think Google's got some, some pretty wonderful tools in the, um, in the Google suite. I mean, I think, 
you got to have chat GPT in there. Um, I, I think AI, you have to be figuring out ways to leverage, maybe not fully integrated into the tech stack, but it's got to be there because it's it. I'm starting to calculate the time savings that AI is being being able to generate for me. And it's it it's pretty eye opening. Yeah, Notion for sure. Pipe drive is what I use for my for my CRM. Um, and Salesforce or Sales Navigator on, on LinkedIn has okay. been a huge, huge thing for me as well. Nice. Those are those are kind of the the things that if I look that I know I'm going to be spending time in every single day. It's kind of it's okay. kind of those things. Pretty cool. And I like to end every episode with a last question. Your question from a previous guest is. Yes. Well, then I have to ask about their community. It's like, what is your favorite community? And what is it about that community that keeps you coming back to it? Mm. This can be virtual, in person, whatever. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for me, the one community that's popping out, it's actually pretty small. And once a month, me and a few other leaders from all across the country just join a hour and a half mastermind uh, group. And I think the guy that puts it on is uh, extremely well connected. So there's always just a mix of great people uh, doing very interesting things that are highly intelligent. And I really look forward to that hour and a half that I get to spend every single month with with that group. And so I think when you can find kind of a mastermind group of like individuals, not all same industry, not all same, um, you know, sector or whatever it may be, but really when you can show up, ha throw a thought out there, maybe even something that you're struggling with and get super high quality feedback coming in, I think is a valuable community that you should always invest your time in. And yeah. that, that one for me that jumps out is just, uh, yeah, just one that I absolutely look forward to joining every single month. Nice. What's your question for a future guest? Yeah, the question I would have for a future guest is if you were to tell a mentor or someone you were mentoring, what has made you successful in your career up to this point, how would you explain it to them? How would you show them and apply a unique attribute or skill set that has shown up for you that's made you successful? So how would you teach your success recipe to someone that you may be, be mentoring? I like it. Yeah. Sweet. That's all I had for you. Why don't you tell listeners where to reach you? Um, we won't plug anything, how they can best contact you. Yeah. And we'll link everything. And Absolutely. So the two places I show up to the most are LinkedIn. Feel free to uh, connect with me there. Let's uh, have some dialogue. I always try to share uh, little insights, tools, frameworks that just add value to, to my community there. Uh, and then my website, which is performancemindsetcoaching.co, where you can really get an understanding of the methodology, the approach, the key benefits, hear client stories, and that's where you can find my blog as well. Uh, something else I wanted to offer to your audience, just because all the things we're talking about, high level concepts don't take you very far. I like actionable tools that you can walk away and implement. Um, so yeah, if anyone in your audience wants to book a call with me just for an exploratory call, um, my offer to your audience is I will walk them through a performance breakthrough assessment where we look at the four key areas that most effectively determine a leader's ability to get better. And we're going to do a little bit of a, a rating and grading system okay. uh, that always allows them to take away some insights and some action steps to go and immediately apply. So that's my Sweet. offer to your audience. And we'll get a link and stuff and so push that. Um, but thank you for coming on. I think this was a really good conversation. Hey!